Okay, today we're going to be talking about chapter 28, Europe and the Western Hemisphere since night. So this first picture we're looking at is from Warsaw, Poland, immediately at the end of the Second World War. Uh, you see children playing again amid the ruins. It looks like they're playing uh, an old children's game called um, London Bridge. Uh, it goes, concludes, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That's uh, kind of ironic. I want to begin to jump into looking at um, how Western Europe particularly experienced the end of the Second World War. And uh, kind of the heading here is the triumph of democracy. Uh, because, of course, of the Cold War, we know that these two systems, democracy and communism, have pitted themselves against one another in a Cold War. And first we're going to look at France. And we're going to start with Charles de Gaulle and work our way forward. Now, the nations of Europe were absolutely devastated by the Second World War. And between 1945 and 1970, there was an enormous recovery that was mainly assisted by the Marshall Plan. Now, George C. Marshall, formerly General of the United States Army during the Second World War, came up with this plan to spend billions of dollars tens of billions of dollars, which at that time was equivalent to what we spent on the New Deal during the Great Depression, to rebuild Western Europe. Um, it had a political purpose. It was to stop Western Europe from turning to communism. And it was quite successful. You know, Marshall's idea that it would in the end be cheaper than fighting a war was absolutely right. And uh, the Marshall Plan did help Western Europe financially recover from the Second World War. Now, Charles de Gaulle returned as head of the state of France in 1958. He sought to remake France as a global power again. And in fact, they developed their own nuclear weapons by 1960. Now, ongoing economic concerns in the 1960s developed due to nationalized industries. Uh, France was in the process of transitioning towards democratic socialism. Um, in 1968, student protests began uh, that became nationwide. Uh, in fact, 1968 was um, a great time of unrest, both in the United States as well as in Western Europe, primarily due to the Vietnam War. Uh, socialists came to power under François Mitterrand in the 1980s and enacted radical reforms such as a fifth week of vacation and a 39-hour work week. So let me repeat. <laughs> radical reforms, a 39-hour work week mandated by federal law, and a five-week annual vacation for workers. The point is that's not actually really radical. Okay, in the 1990s, and the early 2000s, Jacques Chirac represented a more conservative government. During this period, there was a great deal of anti-immigration sentiment, which in many ways contributed to large riots in Paris and other French cities. Now, in 07, Nicolas Sarkozy became the French president. Next, let's move on to Western Germany. And again, I'm going to go through these very quickly, uh, but bear with me. We're going to start with the end of the Second World War with uh, Conrad Adenauer, and we're going to work our way to the present leadership. Now, in Germany, Conrad Adenauer became the founding father of West Germany. And this was called the Federal Republic of Germany. And this regime remained in power from 1949 to 1963. Now, the period of the 1950s was defined by the Verstunder. And this is, in other words, an economic miracle, where unemployment was reduced to 0.4% 
And despite being 52% smaller, had the same economy as the pre-war state. Now, by 52% smaller, that means, you know, West Germany has been separated from East Germany and now is significantly smaller, but had roughly the same GDP as United Germany had prior to the Second World War. So this is an economic miracle. Now, um, Willy Brandt, throughout the 1970s, advocated Ostpolitik, Helmut Kohl was at the head during the reunification of Germany at the end of the Cold War in 1989 and 1990. Newly reunited Germany was far away the most powerful country in Europe economically, a position it still currently holds. There were and are a number of difficulties in reincorporating and revitalizing formerly communist East Germany. For example, the formerly communist East Germany, 48% of the nation's land mass was impoverished at the time of their reincorporation. And so this is going to have uh, some economic difficulties, not unlike what the European Union has experienced with Greece. The current German Chancellor is named Angela Merkel and is currently facing the same Syrian refugee crisis that the United States is, though Germany has opened its doors and allowed many refugees to enter. Next we need to look at the decline of Great Britain. In the United Kingdom, Winston Churchill was defeated in elections as the war came to an end. The new government of the Labour Party under Clement Attal promoted the creation of a, quote, welfare state. In 1946, this social security program was adopted and later spread throughout Europe. They recovered from the war by the 1950s, but were still in relative decline due to the U.S. and the Soviets, and were no longer considered a true first-rate world power. In fact, following the end of the Second World War, the only two legitimate superpowers were the United States and the Soviet Union. Great Britain had fallen from its high point. British economic issues turned around in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher, known as the Iron Lady, famous for her many reforms. In these new reforms, some areas benefited more than others. By 1997, Tony Blair won a landmark election and in many ways was defined by his close relationship with the U.S. government. In 2007, Gordon Brown replaced him briefly as Prime Minister. And so here we're looking at a picture of Margaret Thatcher. Next is Eastern Europe after communism. Many market economies formed in these formerly Soviet socialist blocs and joined NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the same military alliance that the United States is part of. So in Eastern Europe, the countries there overthrew communism and sought to establish democratic capitalist systems. Not only did many of these join NATO, many of these nations also joined the EU post-1990. There were concerns, though, of over-dependence on Western Europe. One major concern of the 1990s was the disintegration of Yugoslavia. The wars there began in 1991 as Serbia attempted to prevent the succession of various member states and or incorporate 
ethnic Serbian areas into their state. In Bosnia, the fighting was particularly fierce, and ethnic cleansing began to occur in many locations. By 1995, the U.S. and the E.U. have intervened, establishing a fragile ceasefire. A similar circumstance occurred in Kosovo in 1999, and again, the U.S. involved itself until a peaceful revolution removed Milosevic from power in 2000. Neither situation is resolved completely, though they both have been largely peaceful ever since. In 2006, Montenegro became independent, which represented the succession of the last non-Serb Republic of Yugoslavia. Okay, so next we're looking at uh, pictures of Yugoslavia and Kosovo. Next, let's talk about Russia. The post-Soviet Union Russian Federation, under Boris Yeltsin, undertook reforms to become a democratic state and a market economy. Vast inequality and corruption in the process tarnished the process as the tycoon capitalism of the oligarchs took hold. A succession of wars in Chechnya caused problems for Yeltsin's government and humiliated the Russian army in their inability to manage them. In 1999, Vladimir Putin became president and immediately started to strengthen central authority. He dealt more forcefully with Chechnya, invading and pushing the resistance movement underground. He reasserted Russian influence as a global power. There is a growing authoritarian streak in Russian government and society. Russia is economically successful at times, due mostly to large oil reserves. And though Putin briefly switched offices with Dmitry Medved, this change was but an illusion. Putin has emerged as the most important political leader in Russia. Next, let's look at the unification of Europe in general. And this is the formation of the EU, or European Union due in large measure to the destruction of the two world wars, Europe began to unify in 1957 by signing the Treaty of Rome. This treaty eliminated custom barriers and created a free trade zone. More and more European nations joined the eventual European Union over the decades. In the year 2000, the EU had 370 million people representing one-fourth of the world's commerce. Now, further economic and monetary reforms continued in the early 2000s as the euro was adopted in 1999, replacing most national currencies in Western Europe by O2. Now, despite recent misgivings, even more countries are scheduled to adopt this pan-European currency. And as a result of the EU, there is an opening of travel and work opportunity for the Europeans. The European Union was not a full one, though as countries are still chiefly independent with almost completely separate military and foreign policies. In fact, this would closely represent the Articles of Confederation in the early times of the United States or even the Confederate States of America in that they are separate states or separate nations united under certain agreements. The EU expanded in the early 21st century into South and Eastern Europe, which were much poorer regions, and as a result required extensive alterations to qualify for entrance. Some of these changes were things such as fully democratic programs, market economies, 
respect for minorities, etc. So essentially these countries had to agree to certain terms to create their own civilized advanced states before they were accepted into the EU. So now we're looking at a map of the European Union. And you can see the nations in blue were among the first to join in 1967. And then you can see the nations in brown were some of the more recent, such as Bulgaria and Romania. By 2002, the European Union had achieved its two major goals. That is, number one, the creation of a single internal market and a common currency. And although it was less successful at achieving common political and foreign policy goals, they came together to create a single internal market, that is a united economy and a united currency. However, they do not act as a unit in regards to war and peace. So next let's look at the emergence of the superpower of the United States. And we're going to look very briefly at American politics and society through the Vietnam era. I spend a large part of a semester teaching this in high school. Uh, you can even take this as a class, American History II. I believe it's taught by Dr. Foster at the Henderson campus. And um, we're going to devote a couple slides to it, however. Now, the United States is one of two superpowers until 1990. And afterwards it became the world's preeminent superpower. Now between 1940 and 1975, the U.S. government drastically expanded its influence on society, continuing in the direction that FDR had set forward with the New Deal. The Second World War created a long economic boom which created the myth of the American dream and a way of life as real wages continued to increase throughout the latter half of the 20th century. <clears throat> Problems did emerge in the 1960s. For one, President Kennedy was assassinated. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, attempted to expand the New Deal war on poverty, but did so with little success as our growing involvement in the Vietnam War increased. There was also the Civil Rights Movement, which was led spiritually by Martin Luther King Jr. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 put an official end to segregation and created a legal basis for equality that was now enforced at the federal level for African Americans. In fact, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 famously prohibits the discrimination of anyone based on race, religion, gender, and so it sets a legal basis for equality. Throughout this period, there were frequent race riots in the cities, and tragically, Martin Luther King himself was assassinated. In the late 1960s, the anti-war movement grew and protested U.S. involvement in Vietnam. At Kent State and at Jackson State, students were even shot and killed by the National Guard protesting the Vietnam War. <clears throat> now, after 1973, the United States shifted to a more conservative approach. Richard Nixon's Southern strategy was very successful in helping him to win re-election. Now, Nixon ultimately won office in part 
on a, quote, law and order platform in 1968, and during that time began to shift politics more to the right. In large measure, he relied on his Southern strategy to win election. Nixon's paranoia over time led to the Watergate scandal, and this caused the first resignation of a U.S. president from office. In the late 1970s, a number of severe economic problems presented themselves under the leadership of Jimmy Carter as there was a high rate of inflation, a decline in wages, and problems presented by a gas boycott. The Iranian hostage crisis made Carter look like a weak leader and contributed to his loss to Ronald Reagan in 1980. The Reagan Revolution made huge social cuts, radically increased military expenditures, and in general augmented government debt. Bill Clinton won office in the early 90s by adopting many of the ideas of the new right of Reagan and presided over a long period of economic successes only tainted by the Lewinsky affair. George W. Bush replaced Clinton in 2000 after a controversial election facing during his administration, the war on terror, a war in Iraq, a period of tax cuts, Hurricane Katrina, a looming economic recession, and so on. And most recently, Barack Obama became the first African American president in 2008 on a campaign promise of change in the middle of the Great Recession and began to push a number of initiatives, most famously the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Now we'll briefly talk about Canada. Canada experienced a long period of post-war prosperity. The Canadian welfare system is created similarly to that in the United Kingdom. There are ongoing political disputes in the province of Quebec, eventually leading to a failed referendum for independence in 1994. Between 1993 and 2006, Jean Shri Tan, who was a liberal, led the government until a number of financial corruption scandals brought the conservatives back into power under Stephen Harper. <clears throat> now let's talk about Latin America since 1945. The Great Depression caused dictatorships to rise in Latin America. Due to the Depression and the war, economic patterns changed substantially, and most countries were forced to undergo some industrialization. After the war, dependent positions are reasserted as more advanced industries required more advanced parts that could only be acquired from Western powers. Large poverty rates further limited economic growth. Military dictatorships in the 1960s remained very harsh. The major model for development in Latin America, which was import substitution industrialization, known as ISI, led to major problems with foreign debt by the 1970s. Throughout the 1980s, the debt crisis collapsed many economies throughout the region. At the same time, though, there was a movement towards greater democratization. By the year 2000, democratic regimes existed everywhere other than Cuba. Also around the same time, a growing number of left-wing governments were elected. This was the so-called Pink Tide. And much earlier, beginning in the 1920s, there was often the perception of the U.S. as a neo-imperialist power due to their economic, political, and military clout in the region. Quote, Banana Republic, 
was a popular concept representing the influence of some American companies, such as the United Fruit Company in various nations. An attempt to change that perception in the 1930s led to the establishment of the Organization of American States. During the Cold War, these lofty goals and support of democratic regimes gave way to aid given to any and all communist regimes. Continuing our discussion of Latin America, let's now shift to Cuba and the threat of Marxist revolutions. Cuba was essentially a neo-American colony. Under Fulgencio Batista and American investors were incredibly powerful there. Fidel Castro began to lead an armed resistance movement in a guerrilla war in the late 1950s. The brutality of the regime caused it to lose popular support and the government ultimately fell on New Year's Eve of 1958 and 1959. U.S.-Cuban relations quickly deteriorated and by October of 1960 the embargo was in effect. Cuba slowly tilted toward the Soviet camp. As a result, an even diplomatic relations were cut in early 1961. The American-backed Bay of Pigs invasion failed famously that same year and threatened Cuba firmly turned toward the Soviets for protection. The Soviets sent troops and nuclear weapons, and of course this started the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we've discussed previously. And the conclusion of that was that in the exchange for the removal of these arms, the United States pledged not to invade Cuba. The Cuban Revolution had mixed success domestically, but more so in terms of health care and education. Economically, Cuban plans to industrialize failed to materialize, and the island was forced to subside on large Soviet subsidies to the sugar industry. When the Soviet Union finally collapsed in the early 1990s, Cuba was forced to endure an incredibly difficult period of adjustment, but the regime survived. Only in 2008 did Fidel Castro relinquish power, and he was succeeded by his also elderly brother, Raul Castro. And now let's talk about nationalism in the military and the example of Argentina. The military was frequently the main power broker in Latin America. In Argentina, the military had typically backed the traditional oligarchy, but by 1943 they intervened and overthrew the government. One figure in the new military regime, Juan Perón, used his labor position to curry support amongst the workers and eventually became president in 1946. In this position, he continued to advance the policies of industrialization, but he also tried to end foreign economic influence in the country. Perón utilized authoritarian, neo-fascist techniques to hold on to power as he and his wife resorted to populist political messages. Growing corruption within his administration and social dissent brought about another military coup d'etat in 1955. Nonetheless, he continued to maintain a strong base of support in Argentina that brought him back from exile in 1973. Shortly afterwards, he died and his wife became president, whose inefficient governance 
led to military intervention in 1976. The military was frequently the main power broker in Latin America. In Argentina, the military had typically backed the traditional oligarchy, but by 1943 they intervened and overthrew the government. One figure in the new military regime, Juan Perón, used his labor position to curry support amongst the workers, eventually becoming president in 1946. In this position, he continued to advance the policies of industrialization, but he also tried to end foreign economic influence in the country. This new regime was incredibly brutal. You see, when Perón died, his wife became president. And her inefficient governance led to further military intervention. And this new regime killed at least 6,000 people during the so-called Dirty Wars. The growing and continuing economic problems in the country persuaded the military to invade the Falkland Islands in early 1982. The United Kingdom responded definitively and crushed the Argentine invasion, also causing the government to collapse there. In 1983, a democratic government has been reestablished, and the old Peronist party became most influential again. Peaceful transitions of government throughout the 1980s 90s and early 2000s ensured a democratic path of governance. Around the year 2000, Argentina experienced a number of severe debt crises, though the Kirchners, elected in 03 and 07, temporarily halted these. And so here is uh, leader of Argentina at that time, Perón, and his wife, who became leader briefly after him. And now let's talk about Mexico. The Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the IRP, excuse me, in Spanish it would be PRI, ruled Mexico unabatedly from the 1930s until 2000. In the 1950s and early 1960s, there was almost non-stop economic growth, and it looked like this was a golden age in Mexican economic history. In 1968, student protest in Mexico City against the one-party state led to hundreds of deaths. The regime began to introduce slow political reforms with new parties and lessened free speech restrictions introduced in the 1970s, allowing greater political diversification. There also, though, was growing Mexican dependency on oil exports, which reached a breaking point in 1982, as Mexico was forced to default on their loans due to lessened revenue. Economic problems also cost the PRI's candidate the election, in 1988 and by 2000 the first non-PRI president since the Mexican Revolution of the 19 teens was elected in the form of Vicente Fox. Fox's government had major problems in dealing with the corruption that continued to be dealt with by the successor government of Felipe Calderon who was also engaged in a full-blown drug war. And here we're just looking at a map of South America, so you can kind of get a perspective of where these places are. Here's Argentina. Of course, Mexico is to the north. And um, we're going to begin to talk about some of these other states right now. But now let's first focus on some of the positives briefly. 
in society and culture in the Western world, and the emergence really of a new society. Now, since 1945, extreme diversity has characterized Western culture. The post-war period by lar is marked by large technological and economic growth radically changing society. A consumer shift has strongly emerged as there is a large growth in the middle class. There is also a shift as many of the lower classes move from rural areas to the cities and as a service economy is created. Large growth in wages encourages the lower classes to spend freely, benefited at times by variations of installment plans. From 1900 to 1980, the average number of work hours decreased from 60 to 40, and there is much more leisure time for leisure activities as a result. Post-war educational changes also open up higher education to new groups and removed its exclusivity to the upper classes. Problems exist in this adjustment though, as in combination with the anti-war movement, large student protests occurred in 1968, both in the United States and around the world. These revolts also dealt with other perceived issues such as materialism or consumerism or even conformity. Critics labeled the new society emerging as a permissive one. Sweden led a sexual revolution in the 1960s. This included an increase in sexual education and a decriminalization of homosexuality. There was a breakdown in traditional family structures. Divorce became more common. Drug culture and use emerged strongly with the use of ones such as pot and LSD. Sex, drugs, and music were all big elements of a strong young rebellion of the late 1960s. So I believe your book calls this a love in uh, from a festival. And now let's talk about women in the post-war Western world. After the war, women were removed from jobs for the remaining men and traditional practices briefly returned. Rising birth rates created the so-called baby boom until they declined in the 1960s through new birth control measures such as the pill. The lessened need to raise children contributed heavily to rising female employment in the second half of the 20th century. Many women received less money for their work and had, in effect, two jobs. These on ongoing inequalities gave rise to the feminist movement, which had dissipated after women won the right to vote following the First World War. By the mid-1960s, demands grew again for equal rights, and female liberation movements started after such theoretical text as Simon de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, detailing the second class status of women. After the 1960s in Europe, the birth rate declined below the replacement rate of 2.1%. And its population has been shrinking in terms of natural births, with immigration supplying the difference. The percentage of women in the workforce continued to increase, though salaries are often still unequal. Women find it more difficult to achieve promotions in higher rankings. In the 1970s and 80s, women rights movements demanded control over their bodies, leading to the legalization of abortion in most developed countries. Women rights movements often included in their activism support for other movements. More recent international women's conferences 
have emphasized the differences in desired rights between Western and non-Western women. And now it seems as relevant today as ever. Let's talk about the growth of terrorism in the post-war Western world. Beginning in the 1960s and 1970s, small groups started to create terrorist acts for considerable media attention. The movements and ideologies of these terror groups are quite varied, as the Irish Republican Army and Al-Qaeda are good examples. In the 1980s, much ideological terrorism declined, particularly in Europe, but internationally others continued. Palestinian terrorism existed against Israel in many locations. Iran, Libya, and Syria all sponsored terrorist attacks such as the 1988 Lockerbie airplane explosion. Perhaps the most notable attack, though, was September 11th of 2001, the attack on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the U.S. Capitol. Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden were behind this attack and were shortly afterwards forced out of Afghanistan alongside their Taliban allies. The new post-Taliban Afghan government has continued to face many problems and Taliban resistance still continues. And now let's talk about the status of guest workers and immigrants. Starting in the 1970s, and particularly strong in Europe, was the environmentalist movement. But first, let me go back to immigrants. In the 1980s, there were 15 million people who held guest worker status in Europe. 15 million. And um, the Dutch passed severe immigration laws limiting the number of people allowed to immigrate. France was even famous for its attacks on the Hijb in 2004. And today we live in a time of xenophobia and ultra-nationalist movements going on in the response to many terrorist attacks. Back to environmentalism. By the 1970s, the effects of pollution became very apparent, especially in cities around the world. In 1986, the Chernobyl disaster sparked calls for change. In the 1970s, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, raised awareness of the dangerous effects of pesticides. After 1980, things were discovered to have been exceptionally bad in Eastern Europe, and much help was needed to improve conditions there. New regulations were pushed through Western legislatures into law by Green Parties, and these Green Parties continued to grow in size and clout, and the most influential worldwide is in Germany. And so we look at uh, increased use of human-powered transportation in many cities. And now let's talk about Western culture since 1945. We'll begin with literature. Western culture becomes very diverse and innovative. Since the 1970s, there has been talk of a postmodern era the theater of the absurd was an early element of this period and reflected disillusionment of people with fixed beliefs, political religions, 
and etc. Existentialism is very similar and viewed in works by authors such as Albert Camus and Jean Paul Sartre. In these works, the idea that God is dead and the world is ultimately absurd and meaningless. This depression in reality is improved by the fact that people have one source of hope and that is themselves. Postmodernism is the dominant stylistic genre and rejects modern Western beliefs in an objective truth, instead focusing on the relative nature of things. Post-structuralism or deconstruction pushes the same ideas in a cultural sense that there is no fixed truth or universal meaning. Mikhail Foucault is amongst the most influential of these philosophers. The idea of the act of teaching and the transference of ideas and power struggles are all major themes of his works. So is the idea that even nouns are culturally produced. His and other postmodern ideas are likewise reflected in the literature of the period. Now let's talk about trends in art. After the war, the U.S. dominated world art similarly to other cultural aspects. New York replaced Paris as the world's art capital. The abstract expressionism of New York is seen in artists such as Jackson Pollock. Postmodern architecture merges tradition with modern styles. Marketing and advertising enter the art world and assist in narrowing the line between art and economic value. Neo-expressionism is yet another new style in works such as Anselm Kiefer's Departure from Egypt. And so now we see the world of science and technology. Let's look at the effects of the war in regards to the advancement of technology. Many World War II inventions later played a role in technological advances such as radar and the computer. Nuclear weapons and technology played a key role as well in the Cold War period. The fast pace of technological change became a common element of present day life. Computers continually advance, but not until 1971 <coughs> did the microprocessor make them commonplace. The development of the Internet further transformed the world. There are those that criticize some of these developments, such as modified foods, for example. The present day world is truly experiencing a technological and informational revolution at the moment unlike any other except perhaps the agricultural or industrial revolutions before it. Of course here's a picture of a satellite. Incredible stuff. We may not have had this were it not for the Cold War. Next, let's look at the explosion of popular culture in our mass consumer society. Popular culture has been linked with mass consumer society following the Second World War. The U.S. is the most influential country in the West and even in the world. Movies, music, television, advertisements, 
all spread the consumer message and its values worldwide. Movies are the first visual medium, but television increases over time and after the 1960s became very widespread. American music is also incredibly dominant nearly everywhere, and most of it is heavily influenced by African American culture. The creation of the music video and MTV changed the industry and made image equally important in production. Sports are also a more popular and major leisure activity. Fans now enjoy their teams anywhere as they are broadcast worldwide, be it football, soccer, the Olympics, just a few examples, of course. Western Europe became a new place in the 1950s and 60s with shared political and economic fortunes. Some problems arising in the early 90s and 2000s show that these issues still exist, though in terms of ethnic conflict. North Africa largely followed a similar growth pattern to that of Europe. And in Latin America, there were enormous problems with dictatorship and political instability that only started to be resolved by the 1980s. World relationships in Latin America changed over time and created new linkages to the U.S., while at the same time Europe decolonized its empires, creating a new non-Western world. 